Good morning. Hello. It's nice to see you all. This is my first session of South by Southwest. I don't know how many of you all this is your first, but welcome if it is. My name is Cecilia Noel, and I'm an associate editor at Stranger's Guide. We're an award-winning publication that commissions stories from local writers and photographers to build authentic portraits of place from Scandinavia to Tehran to Colombia and Lagos. Learn more about what we do at strangersguide.com or look for our special global tickets that we'll be spreading around the festival. Today I'm here to welcome Yves Behar. Behar is a global leader in design and the founder and chief designer of San Francisco-based industrial design and brand development, Studio Fuse, <laughs> brand development Studio Fuse Project. A successful entrepreneur, Behar has co-founded new companies such as August Home, Form Life, and Canopy, and has partnered with industry titans like Puma, Herman Miller, Swarovski, SodaStream, Nivea, and more. Bahar's works are included in the permanent collections of museums worldwide, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Center Pompidou, and the Art Institute of Chicago. He is a frequent speaker on design, sustainability, technology, and entrepreneurship. He has given talks at TED, the World Economic Forum in Davos, and the Clinton Global Initiative. Bahar was also selected as the artist trustee of the board of directors of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. He has garnered over 300 awards, including the Design Miami 2015 Design Visionary Award, the London Design Museum's Design of the Year, Cooper Hewitt's National Design Award, IDSA Design of the Decade Award, IDA Designer of the Year, and Condé Nast Traveler Designer of the Year. Eve Bahar was named a Top 2015 Visionary by Time Magazine and was recently named Most Influential Industry Designer in the World by Forbes. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Cecilia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, uh, thank you for joining on a cold, chilly morning here. I didn't realize I was the first one to go on, so I guess I'm, it was me or breakfast for you. <clears throat> so um, it's actually my first um, South by Southwest, so um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I also want to start just with acknowledging how much of a challenging time this is, you know, as we emerge from two years of global pandemic uh, and as we are witnessing, you know, the terrible results of war in Ukraine, um, you know, I want to simply say to take a moment that our humanity is being tested again and again, it seems. So I made this yesterday on the plane ride. <clears throat> so after 20 years, um, it turns out my book is the color of the Ukrainian flag. Um, <clears throat> so after 20 years of design um, with my studio at Fuse Project, um, I was able to work from home you know, during the pandemic and I was, I was able to finish my book. Um, that was one of the silver, silver linings. And um, the book is called Designing Ideas. And what is Designing Ideas about? It really comes from the deep belief that what design does best, <clears throat> how it contributes to the world in it, the biggest ways, is simply by accelerating the adoption of new ideas. And boy, do we need new ideas to create a fundamental change that needs to happen on this planet. So we got our work, out, cut out, our work cut out for us. So I'm gonna share some ideas about acceleration today. And since I'm a practitioner of design, I'm um, going to illustrate these ideas with actual works um, with that my team and I at Fuse Project um, have worked on. This is just in one slide. I'll sum summarize Fuse Project. We've been around for <clears throat> 22, 23 years. And what we do is we fuse different ideas in, at the service, we, I'm sorry, we fuse different disciplines uh, in service of uh, big ideas. And, um, you know, the variety of these disciplines, really, what, the, the things you're going to see, I don't know what, 
what, where the big idea came from. Did it come from brands, the brand team? Did it come from uh, digital UI, UX? Um, did it come from industrial design? Um, this is really, uh, somebody reminded me, one of our clients in Greece actually reminded me yesterday that uh, gods came out of chaos. Um, and uh, having all these disciplines uh, brought in together um, is really what has made a huge difference. And over the years, you know, our work is really a blend of nonprofit work. Um, this is, of course, with MIT, the one laptop per child. A lot of startup and firsts, um, such as the Jambox here, the first um, um, Bluetooth speaker. Um, and, you know, I would say classical industrial design um, uh, works with Herman Miller, for example, here with a sail chair. But one idea I'm interested in these days is um, design at the extremes of life. And what I mean by that is that design is needed where changes is most acute uh, and most extreme. Um, you know, in old age, in young age, when we're sick, when we have um, de developmental challenges, um, and in times of crisis, whether it's an environmental crisis, whether it's um, the crisis of confidence uh, that we are experiences, experiencing in science and technology and in our political system. So, so much of w what we see in design is really a nice to have. So, you know, it uh, addresses the comfortable middle part of life. Um, but I'm also interested in how design and technology can really address um, the extremes. So what are the ideas that we're pursuing now? Often, I think, <clears throat> you know, the best ideas, the most successful ideas, is when we reconcile the paradox of our lives today. You know, by addressing paradoxical um, you know, ideas, things that we feel like we can't really reconcile, <clears throat> we help people see a future that may be brighter, more hopeful, and more responsible. You know, for example, scientists have been telling us for 40 years um, that, you know, the environment is failing, that our planet needs, uh, that we need to change our ways. For 40 years, you know, we haven't done much, really. Um, and, you know, this, we're realizing now, we're seeing this prediction happening in real time. And why is this happening? It's because, you know, why are we so slow to act, you know, on, on this future? It's because our human brains are not wired for long-term thinking, for long-term action. Our human brains are thinking right now about breakfast. <laughs> We're thinking about the next event, uh, the next party. And so we are really wired as human beings. We're wired for pleasure. And so, you know, the first paradox I would like to um, talk about today is, you know, climate anxiety versus human pleasure. You know, I'm being told we're moving into the roaring 20s um, after, you know, two and a half years of pandemic. Um, and so, you know, I think our role is to under understand both sides and um, to really address the paradoxes of modern life and address them with action because it's easy to feel paralyzed, right? Climate anxiety versus human pleasure. What do I do? It's paralyzing. <clears throat> And so here's, here's some actions we've taken in the last couple of years. So the first one is um, the ocean cleanup. For the ones who are not familiar with what the ocean cleanup is, um, it's actually been started by <clears throat> Boyan Slat when he was 18 years old or so. Uh, it's been going on for 10 years. And um, it wants to clean up the entire Pacific garbage patch, as well as rivers that feed uh, plastic into our oceans. And um, it's, it's a very large area. It's about 500,000 football fields. And it's contaminated with a huge amount of plastic. And so what the ocean cleanup has built is essentially a giant vacuum cleaner that uh, picks up the plastic that floats on the surface. So what we partnered with the ocean cleanup with, um, with the ocean cleanup is um, in turning these plastics that they pick up from the ocean and turning it into a valuable, beautiful resource. The goal here was to show that these plastics shouldn't be in the ocean in the first place, that it actually is a valuable resource, that it can be beautiful, that it can be structural, um, that, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, 
that we can make something like this, uh, sunglasses, for example. So we, we built this concept of sunglasses as a way to show your support to the ocean cleanup and to also demonstrate um, that, um, um, that these plastics should not be there in the first place. Um, so every pair that was purchased <clears throat> contributes to the cleaning of 24 football fields. Um, so it's truly a circular project. The more sunglasses we sell, the more money goes to the organization, the more plastic they can take out of, of the ocean. And I think circularity is something that we um, will be talking about more and more, uh, whether you're a large industry, whether you're a nonprofit. Um, uh, and so, you know, we produced enough sunglasses, and last week we got this incredible piece of news that we sold out of the sunglasses, which means that we now have raised enough money to clean uh, with this action, with these uh, sunglasses. I was going to tell you to go out and buy some for, you know, for, for, for friends and family, but now you, you're going to have to look for them on eBay or something. They're collectible. Um, so we sold enough to clean up the entire Pacific garbage patch, um, which is um, really a fantastic outcome for everyone involved. The next project I would like to share with you is a partnership with um, Jacques, Jacques-Yves Cousteau's grandson, Fabien Cousteau. Um, and he's been an explorer, an aquanaut uh, for all you know, his entire life. And his vision now is to create a research station, an underwater, um, uh, at about 60 feet underwater um, research center which um, will accelerate the, 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 um, the research, underwater research. When you, when you research from the top of the ocean, you're really um, in ocean, you know, ocean conditions, which means that you can't dive every day, uh, you can't send people down every day, and their time uh, on the ocean floor is very short uh, because of decompression, the time it takes to go down and to come back up. When you have an underwater research station, um, you accelerate really that research by 40x because you can stay at that, um, at that level and you essentially, you can see here, you can come in and out of, uh, of Proteus. So his vision is to create the equivalent of the, of the International Space Station, um, but for much needed oceans research. As you know, we only we've only explored 5% our, of our ocean surface. Um, so we know a lot more about space. But space is so attractive. You know, we all look at the ISS in space. We all see uh, cosmonauts going out. Um, and I, what we needed was an iconic, um, an iconic building, an, an iconic way to show that uh, underwater research is just as exciting um, or more than, um, than space. So we designed it on two floors. This maximizes the amount of light that comes from, uh, from the surface. Um, and th there is an exercise ramp. So the, it's really, the, the problems you have with cosmonauts is not that different from, uh, from aquanauts. Um, you have to deal with isolation. You have to deal with um, exercise, movement. Um, and in this case, there's a ramp that connects the two floors, um, and the bottom floor is there for um, the submarine, the, the diving equipment, and research, and the upper floor is um, designed for um, uh, a, a studio, um, a, um, a studio that will connect with hundreds and thousands of schools on a daily basis, as well as the social life of the aquanauts. And then the pods that you see that are on the outside are actually different research um, environments. So universities um, and uh, uh, private uh, communities, non uh, private research and nonprofits will all add uh, these pods for specific uh, research uh, modules. So we currently have um, 
Uh, we're currently in preparation. We have um, done a survey uh, with the government of Curaçao, and, um, and um, it, we're, we're underway in terms of determining the exact spot and location for, um, for Proteus. So um, watch this and um, watch the space. So the other paradox I'm always fascinated and interested in is the notion of technology versus humanity. <clears throat> technology is so often a distraction, especially the technologies we have in our pockets, takes us away from our social life, social environment for experiencing um, the world around us. Um, but I'm in, interested in technology that partners with people's needs in a human, humanistic way. Um, so it's really about our personal lives and um, how we will go beyond addressing this notion of the comfortable middle part of life that I spoke about before. So one of my favorite projects um, is for babies and parents. Um, the, 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 um, um, the lack of sleep that new parents um, um, experience when they have a baby is actually um, a national health issue. Uh, postpartum depression affects a quarter of parents. Uh, exhaustion, illness, marital conflict, all comes out of um, lack of sleep. And of course, there is SIDS, um, you know, the, um, the, the sort of terrible um, outcome of, um, that affects 3,500 babies in the U.S. every year. Sudden infant uh, death syndrome. So I worked with Dr. Harvey Karp for five and a half years. He's an incredible pediatrician, and um, if you go to any uh, state hospitals in the U.S., if you have a baby in the Army, his method um, called, um, you know, the, the happiest baby method is the most used and, um, and um, the, most, the most efficacious way to put babies back to sleep and to, um, and, um, uh, but it's a technique that is, you know, that requires um, you to perform. You have to do, there's five, um, five elements to it. The baby has to be swaddled. You have to shush. You have to make these noises that um, resemble the, 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 the noises that the baby has heard while it was in the womb. You have to swing the baby. So this is, this is hard to do when you're tired, when it's the middle of the night. And so what we worked on for five and a half years is to create essentially a robot that replicates this method, uh, that replicates Dr. Harvey Karp. So I'm gonna share something with you here. Um, this is all um, video that's not been edited. It's a little bit annoying, especially at um, <laughs> 10 a.m. in the morning, but I promise it's gonna go away uh, quickly. So, um, so let's start. So how it works is what you, you're gonna see, these babies are angry, and, and you're gonna, I'm gonna let you experience that right now. They haven't slept in a while, um, they're unhappy, their, their faces are flushed, um, and um, what you will see is the noise, the shushing noise, and the swinging motion is, um, uh, comes in uh, through the AI. Essentially, um, the bassinet responds automatically to um, a baby's fussing and cries. So I told you, right? They're not happy. So the shushing noise has, has come on, and the swinging is happening as well at different speeds. Pretty quick, right? So we're gonna start to say goodnight to some of these. I think the top left is going to fall asleep soon. <laughs> the, bottom, the bottom right is resisting a little bit. Good night. I know, for, for a parent, seeing a baby fall asleep is the most beautiful, beautiful thing, right? <laughs> oh, we're gonna skip that. <laughs> so we also designed the swaddle and the whole system. Um, and, um, and, you know, 
the most important, arguably the most important part of this uh, innovation is to keep the baby on its back. Um, and what's been extraordinary there is that the American Academy of Pediatrics, after three years and 250 million to 300 million hours of babies in the SNU, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the FDA it has um, announced that this is the first, this will get the registration of the first SIDS prevention device um, because we have had, <clears throat> um, we, never, we never advertised that, we never uh, talked about that in the early stages, but that was one of the long-term goals was to, uh, to prove that. Um, and here's, the, here's what's very paradoxical, for about five and a half years, people ask me the question, which is you know, very, the, the most common question I get, which is, what are you working on that's, that's exciting? What, you know, what's, uh, what's the next thing? And for five and a half years, I spent my time um, saying simply that I'm working on a robot that takes care of your baby. And the reaction was universally, oh my God, no, this is horrible. Like, I would never use that. I don't know anyone who would be interested in that. Um, and of course, I was using, I was describing it in that way to really get at that paradox. So this is a robot that takes care of your baby. It's a, it's a beautiful crib. It's made of uh, safe materials. It's, it's, uh, it's got translucency so that the parent can see the baby at all times. It's just doesn't look like a robot that's taken over your house. And the results have been incredible. Um, you know, people all over the world have been using it. Um, we've seen triplets in there. Um, of course, we've seen celebrities. Um, uh, but it's been a, a really an incredible journey to launch a product with you know, which, which, with, with so much resistance and so much doubt uh, and so many questions that is now uh, out there. About 100 hospitals use the SNU as well um, because uh, premature babies um, really need more sleep to grow. The more they sleep, the more they grow. And uh, it's both um, alleviating a lot of time for the nurses. Um, and um, and um, uh, the other thing I want to announce is that now it's also on a rental system, so it costs about $4 a, a, a night, which is about the price of a good cup of coffee. Um, <clears throat> to, um, so now it's, uh, it's on a, it's, uh, it can be rented as well. So the next project um, I want to share, it's called LEQ. And um, it, it, it really addresses the other extreme of life, old age. <clears throat> and in old age, uh, isolation affects about 50% um, of seniors. And about three quarters of seniors are uncomfortable with technology. They're not, you know, they don't know really how to use it. Um, they don't know how to connect with it. They don't know how to organize um, their social life around it. <clears throat> and so the question that we wanted to answer is how do aging adults stay connected to the world when cognitive functions are diminishing, when technology is complex um, and intimidating to them, and when you know, friends and family may not be uh, close by. This is actually launching to, um, you know, to the world after two and a half years of, um, of testing. This is launching next Tuesday. Um, so it's, um, it's an exciting moment. So it's made of two parts, an emotive persona, which is on the left, which I will show, it, it's, it moves, and we didn't want it to look like a person, we didn't want it to look like something um, too cute, we want it to be a presence in the home. Also not something creepy that kind of follows, uh, follows you around the house. Um, and on the other side, it's a portable screen um, where somebody can look at pictures, um, uh, where, where the person can look at pictures, videos, um, and interact with family and friends. I'll show one, um, one video here. Um, this one um, is more of a promotional video, and the next one is um, actually in one of our beta uh, sites. Hi, Walter. Would you like to hear something interesting? Yeah, sure, why not? There are only 18 minutes of total action in an average baseball game. Betcha didn't know that, right? I did not know that. So um, it will, 
it, it's not like an Alexa that responds to your queries. It actually interacts with you as you enter the room, as you move about. It will uh, look at you. It will give you a query. It will tell you, you know, how about going on a walk, etc. And this is one of our beta testers in a retirement home. LEQ is a presence. I feel that there's somebody nearby with whom I can communicate. I can turn to her any time. I'd like to have her music as a background. So there's another beta tester um, I read the other day that said it's like having a roommate without the annoying roommate. <laughs> <clears throat> so the, the last project in this category I'm going to share, we're going to go back to childhood here, um, is a learning companion uh, initially designed for kids with autism, uh, kids on the spectrum. And one in five kids in the U.S. is diagnosed, diagnosed, diagnosed with uh, neurodivergent uh, learning spectrum. And specialists are expensive. In fact, specialists were not available to come to people's home in the last two and a half years. That, that was a, a, a very um, last two and a half years of the pandemic. There was a big gap. The um, the main challenge and what we learned from the team at uh, LEQ, this, uh, I'm sorry, Moxie, this is the name of, um, of uh, our cute little guy here, um, is that for children with autism, is, autism and on the spectrum, um, there are two elements that are most important for them to connect, to make a connection. One is the eyes, the other one are the hands. And so we needed to build a robot with very, uh, very expressive eyes and movements, body movement um, and hand movements. And this is extremely difficult to know, as you know, if we went the mechanical route, if we created a mechanical face. Uh, and the solution was to create a larger head and have a, essentially a rear projector inside that head, which allows us to have a tremendous amount of facial expressions and ways for the robot to connect, uh, as well as simple arms. <clears throat> so Moxie is used for about one hour a day. It's not a all day long type of, uh, type of interaction. And what it does is, is it increases empathy and through fun activities, creative play, story, uh, story reading and storytelling, uh, it builds this social emotional growth that, um, that kids need. So I'm gonna show you a couple of videos here of, uh, of Moxie in action. Um, the first one is Moxie talking to its inventor and having a, having a, a conversation with, um, with uh, Paolo Pirjan, who is the, the inventor of Moxie. Oh, that, no, we're starting with my daughter here. So she's doing a little dance there. <laughs> Um, I don't think I programmed this correctly. Um, let me see if I can. All right. Sorry about that. So. That was a wonderful story. This book is hilarious. I you really can see. want to understand what makes humans laugh, so I can tell the GRL. What do you think made Quick Clack look so funny? I think, I think animals is funny. The animals were so smart. I'm glad the cows and the hens got electric blankets. There were a lot of made up words and silly sentences. It made the story sound very funny. What words or sentences made you laugh? Uh, clickety clack moo. That was a funny. <laughs> I thought it was so funny that the writer made up words like clickety. I think it'd be fun if I were to try making up some silly words. Maybe the other robots would find that really funny. I learned a lot about what makes humans laugh. Thanks for chatting with me about quick clap move. How's the type? You're welcome. Okay. So that's Moxie. Um, <clears throat> Another paradox that we're, um, you know, we're always working on is, you know, beauty and crafts versus, versus nature. Um, beauty and crafts is di directly served really by materials that are subtracted from the earth. And while we all want beautiful things, we need to look for beauty in ways 
that are in balance with our values and the climate anxiety that I mentioned before. So how can we bring this paradox in a positive way into our lives? I think people want industry and designers to make us feel right with the world. And we're looking for more of these types of circular projects that will do that. Um, this one is, is, is pretty incredible and very recent. About 15 billion trees are cut down each day for the paper industry, the furniture industry, home goods, and construction. When a tree is cut, only 50% of that tree is used um, for, for that purpose. The other 50% um, ends up as sawdust, mountains of sawdust, as you can see here. And so we partnered with, um, with, with Forest, which essentially combines two different parts of, um, of, of, the, of the waste created in, by, you know, in the wood industry. Uh, sawdust, as I showed, and lignin. And what it, you know, what it's, it's a, by the way, it's a discarded um, resource. Uh, we get it for free uh, when, we, um, when we print these objects. So the idea here is we turn this waste material into, in this case, a beautiful line of accessories. It can be furniture, it can be um, uh, construction material, it really can be anything, and soon of about uh, any scale. Um, you could print this podium um, um, eventually with, uh, with that material. The material it smells like wood, looks like wood, um, is structural like wood, uh, but as a designer, it's always exciting to invent new forms. This is probably a form and a shape that would be nearly impossible to make out of wood. And of course, we can do it in different colors. Um, um, and um, you know, for me, this is really a good example of how we can reconcile craft and making things that are beautiful um, at the same time with um, the needs of our planet. And um, you know, again, circularity is, um, I think, is the solution for um, you know for 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 this particular um, issue, as well as um, using additive technologies because this can be printed nearby. It can be printed on site. It doesn't have to be imported from India. It doesn't have to be shipped um, across the world across the world. So talking about 3D printing, um, this is actually 3D printing at a housing scale, and uh, the te technology actually comes from here, from Austin. Um, it's a company named Icon, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, so this is a project we've done with, um, with New Story. It's an organization that wants to solve homelessness for people who make under $200 um, uh, a month. And uh, the, whole, the, the goal here is to bring, home, bring homes to families like this one who currently live in uh, shacks. So I'll share with you the um, new story and icon houses that are 3D printed here. Um, the 3D printing material is concrete. And um, we built um, this village. This is the, the, the video of it. But we actually built this village in the Tabasco region. And it's made of, of about 50 homes. So there you see the machine. It creates the wall and the structure within the walls. <clears throat> At the same time, the machine gets moved from site, house, home site to home site. <clears throat> and the, the way the machine functions, we end up with this uh, linear texture on the walls, which I actually think is, um, is interesting. Um, these are, the size is about 550 square feet. It's a very small home. Um, in, this, in this particular case, the, the kitchen was uh, partially outside. So because we have the ultimate flexibility, because this material is 3D printed, we can adapt the houses to the specific needs of the community. And community involvement is central to this type of work, um, which means that the team you know, spent time in, um, you know, with, with the future inhabitants of their homes. And rather than, rather than the, the homes being cookie cutter, they can actually be adapt, adapted geographically, whether you're a little further north 
um, where culturally people want to cook inside, for example. Um, and as we went further south and explored other towns and other villages, um, for example, the cooking was outdoors. And we could easily, quickly change um, the building itself and adapt it to specific needs, whether they're cultural, geographical, or climate-based. It's still a very nascent technology. Uh, but personally, having worked in prefabs, having worked in 3D printed homes, um, and a project I'm going to show you soon, also robotic uh, interiors, um, I believe that in the next 10 years, a very significant amount of the construction industry, whether it's multi-story or singular homes, will be prefab and 3D printed. So the, the next uh, chapter here is home versus tech. And this is probably the oldest sort of kind of philosophy or, or paradox that we've been addressing um, at Fuse Project with my team, um, which is, you know, we bring technology into our homes, uh, but our homes is really where we should focus on our families and our time together. And so how do we make technology discrete? How do we make technology disappear? How do we... Um, you know, reconcile our need for information and control without this, this, you know, disturbing what we consider um, to be an intimate, um, our intimate shelter. So I'll quickly show you the Frame TV. Uh, it's a platform that we designed for Samsung. Um, it's hiding technology in plain sight. Um, and it's also addressing um, what, the 60, 70 year old uh, issue of the fact that when your TV is off, it's essentially a black void. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, and as TVs has gotten larger and larger, they've occupied more and more of our space into our homes, yet our homes are getting smaller. Um, and it really becomes, um, you know, sometimes a family battle. Who wants the TV in the living room or, or in the kitchen and who doesn't? And so what we did is, is address this um, age-old issue. Um, you know, how do we get rid of the black void, the, the, the black screen? Um, and, you know, being steeped in the art world myself, we started making UX prototypes in the office that essentially showed that as you turn off the TV, it goes to art. And, um, but to make it real, we needed to add a sensor. The sensor uh, sees the light, the quality of light in the room, and changes it throughout the day. So whether you have a photograph, whether you have a painting, uh, a drawing on, on your wall, it actually doesn't look backlit. It doesn't have that uh, screen, you know, bright screen uh, element. And to do so, we created initially a collection um, with Samsung, and then museums uh, came in. Uh, the Tate, the VNA, the Uffici, uh, all these institutions came in, and now it is the largest, um, um, the largest uh, collection, art collection, um, that is available um, digitally, uh, on, digitally and on screen. So um, it's 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 actually been tremendous and, and, and uh, to see the growth of this particular behavior, which is turning your TV into a place where you put your preferred art, where you pick, um, where, you, where you pick your own, um, where you, where, that's a reflection of your own taste. So um, this is a quick video that shows the transition from art to entertainment and back. So this is Samsung's most successful new typology for a television. In fact, I just heard um, uh, recently that it's the first lifestyle television to pass the one million unit mark, and, uh, and the product has delivered 100% sale increase uh, year over year since, uh, since launch. It's also the first subscription, believe it or not, this is the first subscription that Samsung actually has ever had. So in addition, instead of just being a first-time sale, um, that relationship uh, continues. And um, one thing I want to note, you'll, know, you'll see in this video, one of the big discussions right before launch were, where do we put the, was where do we put the logo? And to you know, have a, the, the complete illusion that um, this isn't 
um, a television. This isn't a digital, um, uh, constantly digital uh, presence in your home. We place it on the side. So imagine that, the most advanced, the most innovative product that a company makes, um, we tell them the logo shouldn't be there. Um, we put it on the side, and that was the right compromise. Uh, hiding technology in plain sight is uh, something we thought a lot about when uh, I co-founded August, uh, August Smart Lock in 2012 or so. And, um, you know, it's been now 10 years that I don't have keys. I don't look, I don't do this, I don't pad my pockets, I don't look in my bag. I, I, I removed that uh, small bit of anxiety by um, having auto unlock as I approach my home. So. Every day I get home, I may have bags, I may be carrying things, and my door unlocks automatically. Also, I often get calls, uh, I may get one on stage because FedEx wants to deliver a package um, and I'm able to open the door. And it's, it's, you know, it's been going on for 10 years and I still, every single time, I'm like, yes! You know, I'm not getting that yellow tag that I missed a delivery. So this is the very first one that we, uh, that we, that we designed. Uh, we've had over six billion unlocks um, in the last, um, we launched in, I think, 2013 or 14, so in the last eight years. And this is the latest, um, the latest one, which is half the size and has Wi-Fi on board. So I'm gonna go quick now. I can see I'm, uh, I, I was slow to go. Um, this is a startup that addresses life in a very small uh, environment, 300 to 500 square feet. Um, it's actually in, uh, was done in partnership with MIT. Um, and it's about living large in small spaces. We also named the company and uh, created the brand. <clears throat> so you can use voice commands, you can use an app, but you can also just touch, uh, touch a system. It's a force sensitive resistor that makes, that makes it really easy. That makes you feel like Superman when you move things around. My favorite part of the system is the bed that goes away. Um, you don't need to make it, which is pretty cool. Um, on one side, you can have an office. You can, you know, these very small spaces have very little storage, uh, provide very little storage. And so we want to make living in small spaces, which is efficient and environmentally uh, positive, um, you know, much more much more comfortable. <clears throat> and of course, there's other things you can do. <laughs> the last two years have been hard on our psyche, obviously, and I added this project here. Um, I think the team, uh, the team is here from Austin, is based here, and um, I'm, I, I think maybe Christopher Schenk and Adam Chandler are here, I'm not sure. Yeah. They're here. Um, and, um, you know, there is an awareness now that we need to take care of our minds um, as much as our bodies. And this is called the Opus Soundbed. And what it does, it's, uh, it puts you in a meditative state with low frequency vibration and sound journeys um, that are created through spatial audio. Um, so it makes it really easy to meditate and develop in, in, in introspection. Um, so the vibrations are throughout the body or, or, um, uh, in, and throughout the unit. And at the same time, um, the headset and that journey is uh, choreographed together. And um, those, uh, those meditative uh, journeys can be as short as seven minutes or as long as 30, 30, 30 minutes plus. And then in here, you can see the triangular elements as where we are housing the vibration technology. And that's how we distribute it across uh, the body. And like so many other projects that we have done, um, we believe that this can also be a, a nice object in the home. Um, you don't have to put it away. But if you do, it falls up um, and um, it can be left out. So um, I'll show one more thing, which is in the works. And um, it's a quick sneak peek here. Uh, it's a Unagi uh, scooter. I believe in electrifying everything. I've had an electric car now for 10 years. The last six years, it has not been in the garage. It has not been serviced. I haven't even changed the brakes um, on it. It actually has uh, regenerative, regenerative braking. And so, in a sense, 
you know, when I s started um, on my electrification journey with this car, I felt, you know, it, I was doing for environmental reasons. But then the practicality um, of not having to uh, change the oil and stop by the gas station and um, not having to fix it was incredible. So we've worked on this scooter. Um, it has full, um, full uh, suspension. Um, it's made by Unagi, which um, uh, this one is called Model 11. And um, it's lightweight and foldable, which means that you can carry it into your apartment. You don't leave it out there. It's not a rental scooter. It's owned um, either uh, fully purchased or through a subscription. Um, we also have um, a speaker built in uh, into the Unagi uh, for point-to-point -point directions, music, etc. And then even an a ADAS obstacle detection system, which will alert users of um, alert users of obstacles, uh, potholes, etc. So this should be fun. Hopefully, we can. Um, it can be the official vehicle of uh, South by Southwest next year. How about that? I'll skip this one. So, what are the ideas you know you feel we need to work on today in order to address the idiosyncrasies of modern life? You know, which ones are the concepts that will solve these consumer paradoxes, um, and at the same time move you, your companies, your activity. Uh, in this leadership position in the industries. And I have a long list of those, but I'll just share, um, just share a few. Uh, exclusivity versus inclusivity. Um, how do we solve that through, um, through our work? Health and well wellness versus this um, notion of achievement. Fairness versus profit. And gentrification versus integration and maybe one that we can all relate to, belonging versus adventure. So um, you're free to add your own here to think about uh, this part. I often replace the word design with the word intent of purpose. And as a designer, I'm interested in the notion uh, of purpose, really, because design is the first sign of human intent. <clears throat> and in this future, <clears throat> we have more questions and answers in front of us. Design can accelerate these answers by remaining humanistic and address the critical paradoxes that we need to tackle today um, and in the coming years. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to say before taking questions that we will have a book signing at 2 p.m. today at the Austin Convention Center. Um, it's at the uh, South by South, Southwest Bookstore. Um, it's actually nice to be able to do things in person and have a book signing for uh, a book that was launched during COVID, so we hadn't had those so far. <clears throat> so should I read questions and answer them, or is that how we do this? Okay. Um, okay, so the first one is material plastic pellets created by the Ocean Cleanup Project available for purchase. So yes, they've announced that um, since the, the eyeglasses program has been successful and since they've started removing hundreds of tons of plastic from the ocean, um, they will make, um, they, will, they will start working with partners on um, using this material um, and you, you're welcome to come and touch it and feel it and see how it looks. Um, to, to use this material for, um, um, uh, for, for your projects and for, um, for use in enterprise. And then the other question here, can a metropolitan delivery of goods utility be created which enables circularity, sustainable, secure, and affordable and equitable? <clears throat> I, think, I think this person who wrote this question has an idea already. Um, and my, my, my answer would probably be similar there, which would be, uh, which would be yes. We actually are, I just presented last week a project that um, thinks about public transportation as well as personal transportation 
um, as a, um, and obviously it's electrified, um, but as a, as a project of circularity. There's some very interesting companies today doing uh, building cars in completely different ways uh, with new materials, um, and um, we're, we're lucky to be uh, working on some of those. If there's any other questions, somebody wants to raise their hand. Hello. We should, we should, um, so the question is, did we put, uh, did we think about a collapsible helmet on uh, the Unagi scooter? Uh, my answer is yes, but there is a lot to do when you build the scooter, so doing that with partners um, is certainly something that, um, that we're looking at. Um, I've seen more and more demos of airbag helmets as well, which um, I think um, would be great to have, um, uh, but until then, wear your helmets. I have a lot of hesit so so the question is there's a number of companies creating human like robots um, and and um, how do I feel about it or how do we feel about it? Um, I have a lot of reservation about robots that take on human form in fact, all the ones that we had designed and there's about six or seven that we have designed until now, we didn't give them a human form uh, specifically because one of my rules of designing in the, in, in the space of AI and robotics is that the human form creates an emotional attachment that um, can be very problematic, especially if you're addressing it to the aging or children um, and um, um, I, you know, I, I personally feel that um, you know, robots are tools, AI is a tool, um, and replicating human form isn't, um, doesn't always further the purpose of, of this tool. Um, but it seems to be a human obsession. <laughs> um, I would say we broke that rule when we worked on Moxie um, because the eyes and the hands and the body expression was so essential in terms of creating uh, that connection and creating empathy for um, that, group of, um, that group of learners. Yes? Are you expecting to get pushback from, so like, let's say a project like the three tenth houses? Yeah. Are you expecting pushback from the three existing like, housing kind of industry? This is such a disruption. <clears throat> well, we, <laughs> so the question is do I expect pushback when we work on um, 3D printing or prefabs um, uh, from the standard construction industry? Um, I expect pushback all the time on every single one of the projects that we work on. Um, you know, I, I, the meat industry isn't going down, you know, without a fight. We're working on plant-based, you know, foods. The, the, the traditional car industry kind of fought electric vehicles for a long time. Now is moving towards that. Um, I think it's just, you know, if, you, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an innovator, you're going to be pushing against, um, against traditional industries, and they will push back. Um, and you know, in a sense, maybe it makes you better. Maybe it, it, it forces you to really address you know, these habits and, um, and, and uh, it can push you forward. It can also, um, I think, stimulate us to, to make it so much better, to make these alternatives and this change uh, so much more compelling. Yes? Why don't we see more uh, innovations? Why do we see more change faster uh, is, is, I think, the, the center of the question. Well, I've been doing this for 22 years. <laughs> um, I did some projects in 1999 that showed um, the future of the shoe, for example, for a shoe that isn't made out of a dozen materials that end up in landfill um, that are all glued together. and. Um, I thought it was going to launch 
three years later, five years later. I gave it a five-year timeline until that could be changed. But some, you know, change is slow. Industry is uh, slow. Once you have a business and you have found a formula for profit and, uh, and an audience for, for your business, um, it's very hard to transform it and to, and to change direction. So what, what we need are new companies. New companies conver convert all companies to new ideas. Um, and those are hard to find. You know, um, Entrepreneurs are rare. I think one of the best, most exciting exports out of San Francisco and Silicon Valley is this notion that entrepreneurship is accessible and that that everyone wants to do it. So now we're doing projects in Africa, we're doing projects um, all around the world with young entrepreneurs who, um, you know, who are not going to go backwards, who want to move forward. But yes, we need more of them, and I think being here is, um, is a place where we can find each other also and find the support for it. Thank you. Yes? Right. Thank you. Uh, the question is, how do we, um, with the ocean cleanup plastic collection, it's all kinds of different plastics that are at the surface from fishing nets to jugs to toys to um, all kinds of things are floating there. Um, and so how do you get consistency? How do you, you know, how do you treat the plastic? There is a sorting, um, a plastic sorting part of the effort I didn't share there um, in reducing the amount of slides I had. And uh, yes, so there is plastic sorting uh, and identification, and then um, that they're, they're, those materials uh, are broken down. The, the texture is a little bit different when you feel these glasses. It's a little bit more oily, which actually is great on the face because it, um, it, it has a softness to it. So. Um, I guess for a manufacturer, you have to be comfortable with the fact that this is a material that has a slightly different quality um, because it uses a, a different plastics in the way that it's combined, but obviously some plastics are not integrated into the way this is broken down. Yes? Is, so the question is, is there, is, there, is there a client, is there a partner that we haven't worked with that, I would, that we would love to partner with to be innovative and make change? Um, and my question is always, you know, as a designer, I started 22 years ago. You know, I didn't have a voice. I didn't have a, um, an audience, really, for this type of work. Um, and so we started working with very small companies or on these, these kind of esoteric projects that didn't seem to have a lot of potential. And we, you know, what I used to say, you know, in the office is um, we're in the business of turning small shitty projects into fantastic opportunities. Um, and so I've never sort of had this notion that we can't achieve great things by um, only working you know, by, by, by you know, I, I never had the sense that it only took great large industry and clients and sort of uh, uh, very visible type of clients in order to make a difference. And so, um, you know, I, I've never had sort of the sense that unless I work with such and such car company that has such a famous name or a shoe company that has such a famous name, that's going to be the only way that as designers we become uh, known for our work and can make a contribution. Um, and so, you know, to this date, I'm, we're, we're quite open. I think the most important part isn't the name of the company or the size of the company or how popular the company is. It's their desire to change and transform themselves. Um, and that comes in all shapes and forms, in all sizes, uh, for, in that sense. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so of course, you know, I would love to work today with, um, with all these, uh, with, with, with a lot of 
you know, bigger outfits, which we are, um, but it really takes a special CEO, a special person to make that commitment, and that's what we're looking for, um, a great partner in change. Okay, somebody is making this sign, so I have to pick. So let's do two more, and then oh, one more. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll answer this one one-on-one, -on -one and I'll let uh, this gentleman in front here. Go ahead. Um, is there a specific reason why the, um, the Proteus, the underwater station, is going to be placed in Curaçao? Um, well, there is a, an incredible shelf. So the underwater station is at 60 feet underwater, and it's right next to a shelf in Curaçao that drops really deep. Um, um, really deep in the ocean. And this is where you get the most amount of data because you have both surface, um, shallow and surface uh, data from it, but you also get all of that um, uh, deep water uh, 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 analysis that you can make. And so it's, a, it's actually an incredible site. Um, it's uh, it's uh, one of the most uh, richest uh, areas for um, biodiversity, ocean biodiversity, and the idea is actually to make many of these stations. To have them, um, one of the one of the other locations we've been talking to is in Greece, for example. Uh, but the the starting point is Curaçao, and the government of Curaçao was 100% behind it, and. Um, you know, and both the site and, and their uh, government were, were supportive. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.